So we welcome a whole bunch of students at Concord High School who are watching this talk at live stream because the next person teaches at Concord High School, which is part of the Brandywine School District in Delaware, in North Newcastle County. I've had a chance to watch his outline grow, his two videos, and his continuous ways to improve his talk. This gentleman was a teacher at, in, in Concord, loves developing assistive technologies for people with disabilities. He has a great title, Authenticity Matters. He has practiced very hard. We watched him work even harder. He was fine-tuning the talk even last night at the reception. Would you give a warm welcome, and welcome to Concord High School students, to Jordan Estock, who is going to the red carpet at TEDx Wilmington. the first and some of you are hoping the last time you ever see a teacher open up their TEDx talk with a song and dance to Millie Vanilli. <laughs> now I, I heard some laughs but I also saw some heads nodding with me in the back which tells me you know the song. For those that don't, Millie Vanilli was the infamous R&B duo that had their best new artist Grammy Award taken away from them when it was discovered they had been lip syncing all of their songs. And they never sang a single word and seemingly overnight their fame and fortune had disappeared as public opinion put a high value on authenticity. A similar scenario plays out in one of my favorite TV shows, The Antiques Roadshow, where people from across the country bring in items to be appraised and anxiously await to find out if what they own has any worth. The answer always lies in the item's authenticity. Is it a diamond or cubic zirconia? An original or a replica? A Rolex or a knockoff? One thing's for sure, authenticity matters. It's ultimately what determines something's value and worth. This statement holds true in the world of education as well. If we were to appraise our students' educational experiences, we would find the ones to be the most valuable, the ones the students said really mattered, would be the ones that actually had authentic learning incorporated in them. Now, what is authentic learning? Well, it really includes four components, the first of which is a real-world problem. As teachers, we need to connect our students to things outside the four walls of our classroom. The second is this problem should require students to think critically and use higher order skills like inquiry to solve this problem. The third involves the discourse in a community of learners, which really means that there should be a collaboration piece here where students are working in teams to solve problems, collaborating amongst their own classmates, as well as collaborating with people outside the school who are connected to this problem. And the last thing, which is probably the most difficult for teachers to do, is to allow student-directed learning to take place. So this involves teachers taking a step back and allowing students to identify problems, develop their own solutions that teachers probably aren't aware of, and really just be more of a, a facilitator and a resource for their students, rather than teaching very formal lessons. Now, I brought with me today four authentic learning examples that I'd like to share with you because I think they meet even the strictest of definitions when you're thinking about what does authentic learning look like. These examples come from uh, my junior and senior level engineering course at Concord, and they all have the same theme, focusing on developing assistive technologies for people with disabilities. But again, I brought these examples with me because I think they illustrate what authentic learning looks like. In my first example, I'd like you to meet Justin. Justin's a young man in blue scrubs up front. He works at a local pharmacy at a hospital. At the pharmacy, Justin's job is to sort through hundreds of small bags of medication. Students observed Justin in his working environment, and they noticed that he had a hard time uh, grabbing the bags of medicine, a difficult time reading the small labels, and when it came to alphabetically sorting, he just cognitively had a difficult time with that. Another thing the students noticed was that the medicines all had barcodes on them, so they were able to, to, to use that piece of information to kind of drive the device that you see demonstrated here. In one. In five. In four. 
And just so you can, uh, a little side story about this device, the, the impact that this device actually had on Justin, when the students first met him, he was just interning at the hospital. And because of his uh, efficiency using the, the scan and sort, as they called it, Justin was offered a paid position at the hospital, which was huge. Thank you. Thank you. Impressive as the device is, I really want to highlight some of the learning going on behind the scenes here. So the students took apart a scanner, and they were measuring here the optimal height and the right angle to have it at. So when Justin used it, it would scan the medicines 100% of the time. And here you see an early model as, a, as what you saw in the video. This was neat because this, this quickly got something in Justin's hands and the students were able to meet with Justin's job coaches and get feedback about how to improve this to make Justin more successful. In my next example, I'd like you to meet Becky. Becky's a young woman in orange and she works at a local dog treat company that, um, that packages and makes dog biscuits. Becky's job was to weigh and package the dog treats to a specific weight. And she struggled with this, and students realized that it was more than just reading the numbers on the scale. She cognitively had a hard time knowing if the bag was too heavy that she needed to remove bones, and if the bag was too light, she didn't realize that she needed to add bones to it. So they developed an interactive scale that I'd like to show you here. We took our device to Becky and began to teach her how it works. After a little practice with our device, the wedding process for Becky became much more enjoyable and efficient. While using our assistive technology, Becky was able to successfully complete 10 bags in just 3 minutes, which is a remarkable improvement from what she was capable of without our device. So, in a job that previously frustrated Becky, you can see the high five there, she told us that this was, felt more like a game to her, and previously she was frustrated and really couldn't really, and really couldn't do it on her own. Now she's successful and has independence. And again, what's going on? How are the students getting to this point? It's not any formal lessons that I'm teaching. They're doing things like taking apart scales and harnessing the, the load cells out of them and figuring out how these things work. Here's an early prototype that really was of no purpose to Becky, but it gave students some confidence that, hey, we are getting a signal from this scale. What can we do with it now? In my third example, I'd like you to meet Brian. He's the young man seated between the three women. Brian's job at the dog treat company, he was one of Becky's co-workers, his job was to take two small dog treats and put them in a small cellophane bag for packaging. The girls noticed in observing Brian that he had a difficult time with the dexterity and the coordination required to package these bones. So they developed a system that was automated and allowed him to uh, be successful with this job with the simple press of a button. Once our device was functional, we took it to see Brian. Brian got acclimated to her device very quickly and was soon growing excited after bagging his treats. We asked Brian what he thought of our device. Good. You think it's going to help you? It's going to help. Okay. <laughs> So it was cool to see Brian's excitement and confidence, but it was also neat to see these girls really grow. In a male-dominated field, I'm happy to report all three of those girls are pursuing engineering next year in college. Again, some snapshots of how the girls got to where they were. Here's, this is them planning a sequence of the computer program they were going to write. There was a lot of timings with those motors that needed to be figured out. And here you see the motors kind of loosely just on the table, not in any system yet. They're just playing with the, uh, this is actually them testing how sticky that pad needed to be to open the bag. All things that aren't going to come from me teaching lessons on this. It, it, it's just these grassroots organic problems that they're solving. And in, in my last example, I'd like you to meet Rain. Rain's a young lady seated with the viola in her hand. Um, she's a fourth grader actually in our district who has cerebral palsy, and she really wanted to play the viola with her classmates. However, her cerebral palsy made it difficult for her to not only hold the bow comfortably, but she lacked the range of motion necessary to play any notes. So I'd like to show you this video of Rain's before and after progress with our device. So what's happening is, yeah. And so you see how that bow is crooked on the instrument. Yeah. And even if we straighten it, now try to bow a little bit. You can only use that much of the bow. Yeah. This actually swivels, so you can bring your hand as far out as you want. 
There you go. That's oh, perfect. Yeah. There you go. You're getting all that extra. Perfect. So it's really cool for the students and Rain to not only see the progress, but you could hear in the notes too, which was which added that extra layer. Um, again, here, here was this team really focused on improving their prototypes. This is one of the first ones that proved to be pretty cumbersome. They were testing on their own cardboard viola, and they went back and forth from our school to their school, just constantly getting feedback from not only Rain but Rain's music teacher on how the device could be improved. And ultimately, they they developed it to look like this, which is a nice uh, stress ball for her hand to grab, a Velcro strap to keep it on there a 3D printed adapter that clips onto the bow, and a swivel that helps her with her range of motion. The value of these... <laughs> the value of these projects shouldn't be measured by how impressive the technological solutions were, but really by how authentic the learning was that got them there. It's this type of learning that's going to add value and worth to our students' education. And without it, we'll continue to see students lip-syncing their way to graduation only to be exposed when faced with difficult challenge in life. When you're planning your next activities with your students, please remember, authenticity matters. <laughs> supposed to brag as a TEDx organizer about a community, uh, but I have to. We get so much bad press about how terrible education is in any community, and we're no exception. And I just want to make sure, particularly for the live stream audience around the world, so you teach at a high school, public high school? Correct. And you teach engineering? Correct. And this all happened in this, with students at your school? Absolutely. And so this really can happen in a public school in Newcastle County. Yes, it can. And it's working. Yes. Really Wonderful. Good. Thank you for making a difference. Thank you. Wow. That's an idea worth spreading. I see even tears in the eyes of folks here. Uh, those of us who have I have to just tell you what is I'm just telling my team. We have watched his videos and his talks. And you, if I showed you the first video, second video, his rehearsal yesterday, today, you wouldn't believe it's the same person. He just has a secret ability to perform in public that we didn't know that existed. So he did an amazing job. Yeah.